all of you and welcome to the Strategic Management in a Pandemized World panel. Uh, I'm delighted to have an amazing galaxy of corporate stars from Germany, Portugal, France, Saudi Arabia and India on this panel. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Shom Acharya, Chief Executive Officer at eTrans Solutions in India. We have Dr. Turki Faisal Al Rashid, Chairman Golden Grass, Saudi Arabia. We have with us Mr. Abdul Azil Al Bakr, Chairman BMT Saudi Arabia. I hope he can join this panel at the earliest. We have Mr. Jean Pierre, uh, Jean Pierre Kubizol, Founder and Managing Director of CHE Switzerland. We also have with us Mr. Matthias Ernst, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Essentia Futura International Portugal. So welcome to my uh, amazing panelists. Uh, a very quick introduction to myself. Uh, uh, I have two decades of uh, experience as a banker with HSBC and Standard Chartered Bank. And then I moved to Thomson Reuters, where I was global head of treasury based out of New York and Hong Kong. And then I came back as a managing director of Thomson Reuters South Asia. Uh, I left the corporate world to set up Universal Business School, which is India's first green business school. Uh, in one way to give back to the society. Um, so I'd like to kickstart this panel uh, by talking about opportunities uh, in a post-pandemic world. Um, so, you know, we're going to dwell with this amazing uh, galaxy. Uh, you know, firstly, the challenge of how do we change the mental mode? How do we incorporate the lessons of the crisis? Can we speed up digital transformation and create the digital infrastructure for our respective companies. You know, futurist Peter Diamandis believes we'll experience more progress in the next decade than in the entire 100 years combined as technology reshapes the world. Um, so how can we create new businesses um, in our organizations with these technology trends and this rapid innovation that is circling us? How do we re-examine our talent strategy? Uh, how do we shift our focus from being, you know, uh, focused on sh shareholders to stakeholders uh, and, and you know, very importantly, how do we factor ESG as a key commitment of all our organizations as we go into this post pandemized world? How can we switch the business models, uh, you know, and, and actually re-examine our business models, challenge every revenue model that we have uh, and build the organization resiliency and uh, agility, which, which is critical to survive. And finally, uh, you know, how do we continuously in innovate? Uh, and it's okay to be f a failure. It's fine. Be bold. And Indian companies could be world beaters by looking outwards. So I would like our esteemed panelists to give a brief introduction to themselves to contextualize the discussion. Over to you, uh, Mr. Jean-Pierre. Uh, thank you, Tarin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jean-Pierre Cubizot, the Swiss national, uh, the founder and managing partner of CHC in Geneva. I've uh, been the co-founder and the CEO of Eden Bars Group, a surgery dental uh, group based in Switzerland. And uh, lately, a uh, founder of uh, CCNT Group Management, LTD, a company, uh, consulting company specialized in organizational efficiency, risk management, uh, with offices in Geneva, Zurich, London, Paris, Cairo, and Dubai. More details are on, um, on, on my CV on the Oasis database. In, um, in our business, late business in the health sector, in emergency room, uh, we permanently manage priorities, risk, resources in a fast changing environment, particularly when uh, life of patients uh, may be at stake. Risk and performance management, which is a subject I would like to reinforce, was crucial in March 2020 and will still be crucial in the future. Uh, since 2006, uh, the World Economic Forum releases a report on the world risk over the long term. In 2021, the five top risks identified by the WEF were extreme weather, uh, climate action failure, human environmental damage, infectious disease, it wasn't on a 2020 report, 
uh, and biodiversity loss. A worldwide pandemic is a worst case scenario. When an epidemic spreads beyond the country's border, the condition officially becomes a pandemic. The risk of a pandemic are varied, global and complex. Uh, with graduation, there is a graduation from significant catastrophic <laughs> and existential. That means there is a partial or total description, destruction of humanity at stake. The official death toll for COVID-19 at the moment is 4.1 million deaths worldwide as compared to a worldwide population of 7.8 billion we are at 0.05%. Uh, therefore, and that was the conclusion of a previous conference at Horizis, uh, COVID-19 cannot qualify as a demographic risk. The same for India, because the, rest, the ratio for <laughs> India is 0.03, uh, 0.03, sorry. Companies are facing disruption everywhere from all sides. Companies' leaders manage their business today in chaotic and complex environments and must closely consider three critical factors, political, technological, and societal. The societal risk driver on which I will focus later originate from the same cause, which is COVID-19 and its variant, obviously. However, solutions should be designed and implemented in consideration of several different factors. Consequently, many existing systems that we take for granted, such <coughs> as uh, economy, food, energy, production, waste, wa water, water, community life, uh, governance systems, along with our relationship with Earth national systems, must be reviewed and adapted. I will cover the societal risk in the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Uh, over to you, Matthijs. Hello, everyone on the, on the call and Orasis. Um, my name is Matthias Ernst. I'm the founder and CEO of Essentia Futura International. We ha uh, have a business in the United States as well as in Europe. Um, I'm also uh, a family enterprise advisor. That's what we do in our business, where we sit on family boards from, I would argue, very influential families, very wealthy families. That's one part then of the later topics that I want to cover. And on the other hand, we are investors ourselves, and uh, we look for businesses that have a sustainable development strategy. Now, on the first topic, uh, I want to keep it very pragmatic. We have the global... Um, problems, we have the global, global challenges that will be, in my opinion, only be able to be solved if we work together also on a governmental level. On a very pragmatic level, when what is going on right now in the advisory boards in, in my environment, we are looking at the status quo. We are looking at what skill force do we have, what are trends that we want to address where the families or the family enterprise businesses have a knowledge base. If they don't, maybe we enter into a new business. If not, we enter into a passive participation business with others in order to diversify the risk. Because if you are fixed to certain businesses, not everyone had a bad time during the pandemic. Some businesses went very well and uh, because they have been in sectors that have been necessary, essential in the pandemic to keep the economy growing. So what we are looking at are businesses that have a sustainable growth path uh, with a strategy, and at the same time that are able to attract also external financing. And for the external financing, I'm in this field for more than 20 years, and I was also part of the expert group of the Principle for Responsible Investments with the UN. We, 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 be, we believe that you need to also attract money from ESG, SDG-related investors where they will only give you money if you have a sustainable development strategy and that you have also the uh, compliance with certain regulatory frameworks that are essential because at the end of the day, besides the normal corporate credit that you can get, the, uh, 
the essence and the necessity of having also an ESG SDG score for your company, that this is in the overall strategy will be essential in order to attract also external um, investors or uh, being compliant with the stakeholders' beliefs. So that's in short from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Dr. Turki Al Rashid. Can everybody hear me? Yes, perfect. Yes. Good. good. Well, good morning to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, strategic management strategy uh, for uh, crisis. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Leader must be aware that crisis do not wait for the leader to be ready. Most of the time, crisis happened at the worst time. We need to highlight the importance of strategic management in time of crisis and disaster. Prepare and empower the society to protect themselves, to live with what I call it a positive fear. Uh, crisis and disaster consider one of the most important obstacles to sustainability. Let's define first what is strategic management. It is the continuous planning, monitoring, analyze, and assessment that is necessary for an organization to meet its goal and objective. The strategic management process involves analyzing cross-functional business decisions prior to implementing them. According to our uh, book titled uh, public governance and strategic management capability, public governance in the Gulf state, there are two types of strategic management, from public sector perspective and then from private uh, sector uh, perspective. The strategic management in public sector mean developing an explanation of a firm performance by understanding the role of external and internal environment, positioning and managing within those environment. Strategic management in private sector perspective mean the interdisciplinary field that study the behavior of companies and other market uh, parties. Crisis and disaster risk reduction require a very clear, a clear strategy, vision, and priority with a strong coordination with all the stakeholders. When it's come to managing crisis like the global pandemic, there are five successful strategy in containing the pandemic. Test, test, and then test again. Isolate infected people. Get ready and act fast. <clears throat> Social distancing. Promote personal hygiene. The lockdown, whether in India or any other countries in the world, uh, to an increase in price of basic commodity and unemployment rate that have effect negatively the society's well-being. Most countries will not be able to handle due to their limited sources. Limit, limited resources for successful crisis and disaster management strategies. Collective effort to reduce the impact of the crisis, understand all the risk factors, improve knowledge, capability to assess all risk to be able to deal with them. Empower the society, empower the individual, Connecting all available resources, energies, and capability in an organizing uh, manner. Let me summarize what I want to say. Crisis and disaster management require leadership capable of making critical decision. Decision must be balanced between economic, social, and safety requirement. Critical decision cannot be left to the military leaders 
or doctors and scientists. It is the political leader's responsibility. I'll conclude what I want to say. We live in a complex world. Disasters are inevitable, and there is no time for false security. A main strategic management for crisis and disaster center is required. Working team need 12 to 24 months to be homogeneous team. We need to create the team now. If not, the team will not be effective during the crisis. I'll close what I want to say. No country in, the, in this universe without empowering the society can succeed. Thank you for the opportunity and happy to receive your question. For more details about myself, you can visit my official website, www.tfrashid.org. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Shomu. <clears throat> Love to hear your perspectives. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Shomu Acharya. I'm the chairman, chief executive of eTran Solutions. I've been in the corporate and business world for about 50 years now. Started in the petroleum industry. Have moved in the global position. And then I was, before I started my company, I was the managing director of an American multinational joint venture in India in container leasing business. <clears throat> and then I started my own company, which is eTran Solutions. The company is a telematics company focused in the logistics domain. Now, more of that later. Now, so far, we, we as business people, corporate leaders, were used to growth. Give and take, a little here, a little there. Our challenge used to be primarily technological obsolescence, competition, and occasional disruption. COVID has come up with a paradigm shift. A shift which... A shift which I dare say none of us has visualized is brought in an unknown unknown and we still don't have the end in sight. It, in a post-COVID scenario, the entire strategy of companies <laughs> at different levels demand a different kind of preparedness and resilience. You have a different risk management propositions, which were not there earlier, present so much. It was there, but not so much. Comes into focus. Protecting people, supply chain, in the current situation is one of the most critical things for the corporate management strategy. And the focus has to be very clearly on responsibility, sustainability, and transparency. Any short-sighted, profit-focused action will be suspect. And this is what the new world is bringing for all of us. All of us have to look at it in a completely different perspective altogether because, as Jean was very correctly saying, in, in, in the new challenges of, of the, what, what has come up today, uh, infection or such unknown challenges are probably going to come far too many times in the near future. And our preparedness, our strategy has to prepare all of us to ensure that we can survive and flourish despite that and take the world forward thank you very much thank you shomu thank you that was wonderful uh thank you abdul aziz for joining the panel uh would love to hear your opening remarks and a brief introduction to yourself yes uh thank you and sorry for the late uh, entrance uh abdul aziz al bakr uh, chairman of uh, business management technology saudi arabia uh, 
just to highlight a bit about uh, where we are and what we should be doing, I think everybody can agree that uh, this pandemic has uh, broken a lot of operating models, a lot of supply chains, and changed uh, a lot of the customer behavior uh, even. Uh, the the important part was like what you just said is having that resilience and to uh, adapt to the change and the survival mode which is very important for any organization and uh, since we're talking about India and the business leaders in India, it's very important to see where does uh, the whole change, the trends, technology trends, business trends, even customer behavior, workforce trends, how it changed and how it would benefit the Indian economy and the structure of the Indian economy and the potential of and the outlook of the Indian economy. And I think it's in favor for the uh, for a lot of sectors in the Indian economy uh, because uh, one thing uh, that we we can all see is that uh, outsourcing has grown worldwide. Second part is uh, being more digital uh, and. Uh, going online and so on. And all of these areas have uh, a strong foundation in uh, India. India is actually fueling uh, the uh, digital world or the technology development worldwide. Second part is the, the, the business uh, process outsourcing. A big part of it comes from uh, India. Uh, so I think that that is something uh, to consider for business leaders uh, who are internationally and even Indian business leaders when looking forward and how to uh, position strategically their companies or their enterprises down the road. And uh, we can uh, talk uh, a bit more about uh, the best uh, options or the best way to uh, strategically manage the post-pandemic and how to grow and so on. Thank you. Thank you so much for your opening remarks. So, you know, I see this as, uh, the, you know, the, there are multiple paradigms, but I'd like us to focus, if possible, you know, there's the digital transformation paradigm, there's the environmental impact, the societal impact. And, you know, I call uh, this the COVID-19 uh, bridge, right? It's uh, you to digitize your business and crossing the digital Rubicon. How are companies going to do that? On the environment front, uh, we've seen wide scale uh, disruptions, uh, you know, because of COVID. But I believe this is just a trailer to the massive environmental impact that we are seeing across the world, including where I sit right now, which has been inundated with floods uh, in, in uh, Western Maharashtra. So, uh, you know, the European Union has taken a big leap of faith and very, been very bold. Can other nations move in that direction? Uh, and finally, uh, the social impact, right? Uh, there has been a lockdown, but there's no lockdown on energy. Uh, so how can organizations governments uh, actually focus on what's uh, massively accentuated is the inequality gap uh, due to the pandemic. And what can corporates do? Because this is part of our environment. So uh, I'd like Matthias to uh, take this forward. Well, I, I, I would, I'm very clear on the leadership proposition first, uh, because this is for me the essence. There's a difference between leadership in managing the leadership of a business, being the manager, the CEO, and manage the business, manage politics. This is also, you have a government and it needs to be managed. With all the crisis, it's difficult, but it needs to be managed. The other thing is having a leadership where you have a visionary aspect, meaning you have a vision for something new, but you said digitalization. Well, it's a buzzword at the end of the day. How do you do that? Meaning concretely, 
I like to make examples. If you have a corporate, uh, mid-sized corporate operation or a larger one, and you are the CEO, and you are faced with the situation that we have right now, you need to be very clear on your personal vision and on your board where the company has its competitive advantage, where it makes sense or not. You can be wrong after that, but you have your strategic plan very well thought through. But then comes the critical point, two things. First, you need to engage your workforce and you need to communicate with them as best as you can. And this is a challenge if you're in a virtual world because you cannot have the personal interaction. So there's a new skill set necessary, number one. Number two, in order to have your vision transported, they need to follow you. They need to feel that you are calm, that you can look through the crisis and that you can bring the company to a profitable growth path, post-pandemic. And then the third thing is you need to have a different skill set within your workforce to not just announce the transformation or the adaption to this new environment, but also to execute this transformation. And this is a skill set which is not easy. Now, back to our topic, we look at uh, the past growth, companies, internationalization, all good. But now we face a different set of skill sets that is that is a different environment and a different set of skill sets that are needed. And I think the key is the implementation and therefore you will see who are really good leaders and who can really lead companies to the next phase and which companies will fail, although they have a beautiful idea, but they are not capable of bringing it on the run. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Turki, your views on this uh, paradigms that we need to focus on as leaders, business leaders? Well, if we're talking about the crisis, there is two perspectives here. If we talk about a business leader, a business leader should look at every crisis, there is an opportunity on this crisis. So if, if it's in the private sector, there is an opportunity, how could you lower your cost and increase your profit. So if is it a business uh, uh, mentality then or business perspective, you got to look at this crisis as an opportunity. How could you make the maximum amount of income for you and your shareholder? Because that's your responsibility. If we look at the public sectors as a leaders, they must uh, recognize that this crisis definitely it's not the first one it's definitely it's not going to be the last one and they have to look at this crisis to improve uh, their knowledge and their awareness that without uh, social empowerment society empowerment individual empowerment public and government empowerment if we look at the crisis of the pandemic we will find only a handful of countries uh, that they have done very well, such as like Saudi Arabia. We were very lucky. When the crisis happened, it was nearly the time of Ramadan and Hajj, which we have abundant of uh, food and abundant of medical supply. Many people, they ask me, why did Saudi Arabia did it very well? I think they were ready. The Saudi leaders were ready because every year during Ramadan and Hajj, we are expecting all the diseases, all the viruses around the world to come to Saudi Arabia during the Hajj. So we were mentally ready to manage that crisis. And I think recognizing the problem is half of the solution. And public leader, uh, they, they should be recognized that they have to be ready. I hope I answered your question. Yes, very well. Uh, show your perspectives. Right. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it in, bring a new perspective also under the commenting on the digital focus. I think uh, communication post COVID has become much, much better than before. Earlier, I as a chief executive, my connect with the team was primarily on letters, on right, uh, in writing. Today, I am very, it is very easy for me to directly connect to the entire team or a part of the team and communicate the vision. The vision conveyance probably has become much better and more and more the chief executive, the senior leaders should utilize this 
to bring in the entire organization in sync to a particular vision. And the digital bets are going to be the order of tomorrow. COVID is going to hasten digital transformation at a very fast, fast pace. And the companies who would not be able to keep pace with that will find it very difficult to survive. I'll now come into uh, the domain I come from. I'm an MSME company, which is in telematics and logistics domain. MSMEs are faced with a huge challenge resulting from the perception of COVID. And I, I give you an example uh, in the restaurant area. A friend of mine who was a partner of a restaurant chain decided three years back to take franchisee of one of its branches. A new initiative, he invested huge amount of money to build it. In two years, he's just finished. I see people uh, uh, who work with me in the transportation area. New guys who have come three years back have just got finished. So total risk management strategy for MSMEs are going to be quite different than others. And that's because they are the biggest, at least in a country like India, anywhere in the world, they're the biggest employers. The moment MSMEs fail, huge lot of unemployment comes from the country. So there is a strategic requirement of creating a risk managing uh, uh, action plan for MSMEs for the future to ensure that this particular area is protected. Thank you. Thank, very you. Much. Thank you so much. Abdul Aziz, your views on the paradigms? Well, uh, I would I think uh, looking at the successful uh, organizations and at the leaders that have came out of uh, this pandemic, it's uh, it's about two things that uh, going forward, which is uh, agile strategy making or agile strategy planning, which is a continuous development. It's not like before you do a strategy, you gather just one time per year and develop a strategy. Now, it's totally different. You, you have uh, uh, a lot of risks. Nobody knows how the new norm is going to be. Nobody knows what's going, uh, what's going to be, how uh, to, uh, 2021 or 22 is going to look like and so on. Uh, another part is, another uh, important part is the option-based uh, planning or scenario-based planning. This is very important to go forward. Develop uh, scenarios, start working on it, test it, see what's the best fit, and this is uh, to be done in conjunction with all of the organization regardless if it's a public sector or a private sector. And based on it, develop what is the requirements and how to go forward. Uh, it's been proven that scenario-based or option-based uh, uh, planning is, is the best course and it prepares you for the unknown. And it puts everybody on the same level. Uh, nowadays, I think there is uh, some organizations that, that have created the team that are called forward uh, or ahead uh, planning teams and so on, which are doing sp specifically this kind of task, scenario planning and testing the scenarios and so on so that the organization would be ready and you can always test and plan your resources and your capabilities to be on the safe side and to plan for growth because that would uh, that would be the best possible way to to do it alongside with the strategy agile strategy planning because it's it doesn't work anymore that you you do a strategy for five years and sit on it and that's it. 
you know, you have to be dynamic, you have to change, you have to revisit your strategy every once in a while, and you have to pre be prepared uh, in structure-wise to do that. That's my uh, my input. Thank, thank you, thank you, Jean Pierre. Your views? Yes. Um, well, I, I I just like to make a point. We are at this point. We are not in a post-COVID situation. I just remind you that Australia is in full lockdown since yesterday. Um, so even if we have the same vision in companies. Uh, and we have uh, the strategy that uh, Dr. Turki Faisal al Rashid explained uh, very well. We need now to talk about adapting those strategies. And let me give you some, some examples. Um, in response of the COVID-19, particularly in Europe, um, governments have increasingly shifting uh, to protectionism, to protection the nation that they, they uh, for, for self-sufficiency, for self-sustaining uh, economies. Uh, we have had uh, company uh, countries closing borders. Uh, I remind you, Italy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Great Britain uh, just a few weeks ago for, for vaccines. So basically, uh, companies uh, need to adjust a strategy to take into account those shifts in uh, politics of countries. Because we, we tend to focus on companies that are much influenced by the politicians uh, or by the, the state leaders. If we take the case of uh, India, uh, having more than 4 billion in pharmaceutical business, the third country in the world, okay, the first one in generic medicines, they need to look at what's going to happen with all those protectionism and, uh, and other uh, measures that um, government may actually take. Uh, more than ever, consumer, employees and investors are expecting companies to reflect values. Okay, their vision is challenging the vision. And we have noticed the lack of congruence between the value statement normally published by companies and actions they are taking on in the field. And uh, that has an impact mm -hmm. on how those people, employees, customers, and, um, and all the others are looking. Um, COVID-19 has revealed serious collective vulnerabilities, checking strategies, governance, the role of politicians, economic systems, work, organiz uh, work organization, uh, social relation and lifestyle with lockdowns, for example. The pandemic has transformed the needs and demands of workers. Uh, particularly on health and security in home office, manufacturing, uh, facility shops, uh, transport, um, distribution centers. We have never seen in the whole history, at least as far as I can go, and uh, maybe the generation before, patients selecting treatments and vaccines. Okay, they prefer Pfizer than AstraZeneca. Okay, <clears throat> talking about strategy, we could talk also about the strategy of AstraZeneca as compared to the one of Pfizer, for example. Um, people have, have moved into uh, closing of school, uh, work conditions, different work conditions, uh, isolation, um, the fear to loss, uh, the, the, the post-traumatic stress disorder, we have many things like this, um, that has changed the way of working. 
working at distance, working from home, uh, when, where, and how with, uh, with technology. So all, all the things that will require the adaptation of the strategies that were probably defined a couple of years ago. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, if the, any of the external members have any questions, we uh, appreciate that. There's not too much time. So we've got a few minutes left. So I'd love to uh, end by asking each of you, uh, you know, in, in one line or one word advice on to the CEOs uh, on what they need to do. Um, so we'll start with, uh, let's start with Shomu. Why don't you go with that one piece of advice you think CEOs can take home? Right. Communicate and be always available to all your stakeholders. Focus on trust and digital bets. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Matthias, you'd like to go next? Yes. It's creativity, innovation, because that's what brings the things forward. Be a critical thinker. Think twice, but be curious. Walk the floor. And if there are a lot of doors, be curious, be curious, open the door and look into it. Maybe you find something interesting that you believe you can connect to your existing business and be an active supporter of entrepreneurship. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Abdul Aziz, your guide to the CEOs. Thank you. I would recommend always to uh, adopt to the agile uh, development and agile strategy management. Always continuous development. Always try to uh, to improve uh, and bits by uh, bits and pieces. It doesn't have to be a big bang. It just has to be improvement, and that creates better. Uh, uh, moral with the, the, the team and the stakeholders and quick wins. <clears throat> agile. So agile keeps coming up. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Turki, Fezal, what would your advice be? Well, my advice to the CEO is you have to be ready, but you have to remember that God gave you something. So there is a tax on your brain. There is a tax on your effort. There is tax on your willingness. So you have to do something good for the mankind. It's not a matter of just your how much money you will make. There is something higher than that, and you have to give. There is that you have to pay taxes on your uh, energy, on your brain, on your income to help others because the best thing in life is to give to others, society, to be good for mankind. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. And uh, Jean-Pierre? Yes, I, I came across a, um, a document uh, on India, uh, which has been prepared for, it's a white paper. It's called Indian Cities in a Post-Pandemic World. It's a white paper for the World Economic Forum. I would engage CEOs to read this because it's a well-done uh, document. Um, the, the, the last word is... <laughs> We have been able in, a la in, in, in very few months, although there were uh, work being done before, to, um, to develop and distribute vaccines in very few months. And this was the result of a collaboration between the business, the private sectors, the government, the NGOs. Uh, that have exchanged information, and rapidly they came to a solution. Okay, Although it's not perfect, but the solution is there. So my suggested business model would be for all CEOs to say, let's work with the government, with the politician, with the NGOs, with all those guys, to make sure that we develop solutions and we adapt our strategy for the future. Thank you. Thank you. So that was fantastic. A lot of great advice from leaders from all over the world. Uh, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, I'd like to end by saying, you know, you've got to earn the right to be a CEO. As uh, Dr. Turki mentioned, you've got to earn the right to have a purpose for the society. Uh, and you, 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 of course, you will make the, the 
bottom line, but let's go after the triple bottom line. Let's uh, create a momentum which can actually uh, empower society uh, to achieve so that we, we all fulfill our purpose in, in this world. So with that, I'd like to thank the amazing panelists. Thank you, each one of you, for those wonderful contributions. And uh, wish you all the best in whichever part of the world you are. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.